All right, we are. It says we're live, Elliot, so we must be live. I want to welcome everybody. It's Tuesday night. It is two days before Thanksgiving. I hope everybody's doing well. And I know you know who's over here. I got Big E, Elliot Carson, out of now out of Denver. How are you tonight, Elliot? I'm doing great. Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for everything you're doing for the for the program. It's been great to to watch and get reconnected. So really appreciate all that you're doing. Well, I appreciate that. And I was glad that you and I got to connect in Hawaii. It's such a memorable week and, and game. And we had such a fun time in the stands watching our our guys put up, what was it, 63 to 10. Yeah. And and it's been an up and down season. We'll get down, we'll get to it later on, but we're going to tell Elliot's story tonight. And Elliot, as I told you, when folks start rolling in and they're already rolling in, I will. <laughs> Dwayne Jones says you're Lebanon's Blue Devils best. <laughs> wow. Lebanon's got a lot of good ones. They're, they're, they're on the up. It's great. Yeah. Wait, Dwayne, did you mean beast or best? Or are those synonymous for Elliot and the way he played back I'll in the day? Thank you to one. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Nice, nice. I was going to say Elliot's a 2001 graduate, played a little TE, which this past weekend the tight end showed out, didn't they? Yeah, they did. It's always it's always great seeing tight ends contribute. I got a special place in my heart for that position. Oh, no, no kidding. All right, you got to tell the origin story. How in the world did you escape the clutches of that team from the East, the team from the South, or any of the other state teams that easily could have had your services? How did you end up in Nashville and play for the Black and Gold? Yeah. Yeah, kind of an interesting story. I, you know, I grew up in Lebanon. Lebanon's about 30 miles east of Nashville. And naturally, if you grow up in middle Tennessee, most of your family wears orange. So I, I grew up around it. I, I, I learned differently naturally over, over the years. Uh, I actually didn't get recruited by UT. I was recruited from you know, a few schools, not, not Tennessee. Um, I, I remember I was thinking about it before you know, getting on that, that process. I believe Vandy was my third recruiting visit. So one of my one of my lifelong friends, Ryan Alls. Ryan and I actually went to school together starting in kindergarten all the way through Vanderbilt. So the way that I remember it playing out was I took a recruiting visit the first weekend, I believe, to Memphis. The second weekend, I was at North Carolina State. And I actually felt pretty good about North Carolina State. And mm -hmm. Ryan took his visit to Nashville, to Vanderbilt. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, this was before cell phones. So we, we got back from our trips and, you know, we're kind of talking. And I think I, I can remember being pretty close to signing with North Carolina State. Felt good about the program, felt good about the offense. Mm -hmm. um, but Ryan was like, look, I, I really enjoyed the visit. I think you gotta, you gotta go see what it's about. I just have a good feeling about it. And so I, I took my visit to Vanderbilt that, that next weekend and kind of felt the same thing, just the, the campus, the education, the SEC, everything that went into it. But it, it was kind of a near, you know, looking back now, maybe a near miss in terms of how things could have gone differently, but certainly fortunate and glad that I made the decision I did. Ryan knew the whole time you were coming to Vanderbilt. He just wanted you to get it out of your system. That's right. Go see the Wolfpack. Who was the coach for the Wolfpack at the time, if you remember? Uh, you know, I, I don't remember. I'd have to look back. I, I can't recall. It probably, that it probably wasn't a hugely memorable coach because you'd clearly made right. a decision. Um, yeah. All right. There had to have been one key thing that separated Vanderbilt. And if you say it was going out on the town, for your recruiting visit on that Friday night. We'll go with that. But as I tell most folks who are your age and older, statute of limitations is long expired. And if they haven't, we have plenty of criminal defense commodores ready, willing to take your case. I love it. I love the protection. No, I, you know, I, there, there are probably stories for another day, but I, I think it's just, I, you know, honestly, I, I think about what we have going now, there, there's really nothing going against it. I mean, you know, living in Nashville, certainly a great city. Nashville's blown up since, you know, since I was there in the, in the late 90s. But to live in Nashville, I mean, you know, some of the other SEC schools are in small towns, so they don't have the, the off-campus life of a Nashville. Playing in the SEC against the best, uh, you know, it was kind of nice. I don't know that I really considered it as I got closer to college, but it was kind of nice to be away from home but not way away from home. So you kind of had that right. benefit, you know, my, my mom and, and dad parents could drive to the games, but you were enough away where you had your space. And so it, it, I think the stars just kind of aligned. Certainly maybe there were things on the recruiting visit that were, you know, unique, but I think it just all, it all made sense. Did you and Tyler ever have that knock on the door and it was unannounced parental visit? Hey, we just wanted to come say, take you to lunch. We didn't tell you we were coming. 
you ever have that? <laughs> I, you know, my mom, <clears throat> my mom was always really good about, about letting me know. I didn't, I don't remember having any, any pop-in business, certainly possible, but I think they were good about, you can't, you know, you need to have your college life and, and they were probably, you know, in some ways kind of glad to have me out of the house. I, I'm sure going through high school, I was eating them out of house and home. So they were glad for, for the groceries to be on somebody else's dime, right? Look, my family was 400 miles away and I got that phone call. Hey, we're in Franklin. Can you meet us at the cooker in an hour? Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. And it wasn't a football weekend. But speaking Although of the cooker, that was players, a game. It was hard to hard to pass up dinner at the cooker, right? I mean, that's... oh, believe me, I met them. Yeah. Uh, we got your roommate Tyler is here. There he is. We, and we're gonna. I want you to pause on Tyler. We're gonna come back to him in a minute. Yeah. We got OJ Fleming in the house. We got Darren Rothenberg oh. in the house. <laughs> Tyler, <laughs> Dwayne wants to know who'd you make mad to have Tyler for three years. All right, let's just get into Tyler and all that yeah. that silliness. I know you guys room forever and have way more show. I ought to have you both on at the same time because it would be the Elliot and Tyler show. I know there's a ton of great stories in there. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, you know, certainly want to get to the Tyler. Want to say hi to OJ. I had a ton of respect. OJ was a tight end ahead of me. Really looked up to him. Much respect for OJ. Roth, we played against each other in high school. It didn't go well for us. Would have known Roth for a lot of years. Actually got to spend a little time. I, I lived in that city to the east for a couple of years where Roth lives and, and uh, you know, we got to hang out a little bit, but yeah, Tyler and I, we, we roommate, we were roommates for three years. He, I think he had the story backward on Facebook. He said I was chasing him. I think he was chasing me, but you know, we, uh, we had some, some of those, uh, you remember towers certainly for, for a lot of folks that had been around campus, uh, lived in Mayfield for a year. So Tyler and I definitely, uh, definitely had some, some good times on campus. You know, I was sharing Bernard with you a little bit before the call I had a, Really scary situation, kind of one of those life changing moments. Tyler and I and a teammate Chris Cook in a in a car accident that we fortunately made it out of. But a lot of stories with Tyler that uh, we certainly could share on air, and not probably some that we shouldn't share on air. Right? Yeah, just keeping in mind this will eventually be a public video on YouTube, so we'll That's just right. keep it at that. I want to right. welcome Aaron Smith. Hey, Aaron, good to see you, bud. He's in the house tonight. <clears throat> Elliot, you go from. A relatively small Tennessee town where you played big time football. But as we all do, that transition to Division One, SEC, and you're playing a skilled position, that's no joke. That's that's not an easy transition, even for the best of athletes, even for the smartest of those in, in school. How was your transition? And and here's my 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 true question at the end. How long did it take for you? Once you got to campus, before you really felt comfortable in all phases of the collegiate life, academically, socially, and athletically. Yeah, you mentioned skill position. I would argue, and maybe OJ would agree, the most skilled position, right? Tight ends were, were uh, jack of all trades. But no, I, you know, I came in, I can remember coming in out of high school. I was, you know, a, a tall, kind of rangy kid. I probably... You, you can remember in high school, the, the roster, you know, your, your height and weight was kind of what you wanted it to be. So I want to be this tall and weigh this much. And I think I, it showed me at 235, but I was no, nowhere near 235. So, you know, the first challenge was putting on some weight. And, you know, you talked about getting comfortable. I think the first time I got really uncomfortable was, you know, a 200 and maybe I was 220 pound tight end. They kind of had, you know, the Fanny was good about using the tight end really through the time that I was there. H back, a lot of move, a lot of motion. Um, part of that meant lining up as a fullback. Paul Morgan's better, you know, built better as a fullback than I am. And I can remember trying to block Jamie Duncan and feeling like my <laughs> head went inside of my inside of my shoulders. And that was one of those moments where I said, okay, I got some, I got some weight to 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 put on and some strength to put on. But I can remember they there was a I think a debate early on, maybe a, a, a package. I, got a vague memory of a blue personnel where I would come in kind of as a slot receiver. And this was my true freshman year. So I think there was maybe some discussion about playing as a true freshman and then ended up, you know, redshirting, which I think honestly was, was best for me, but really it wasn't until, you know, a couple of years. I mean, you just really have to get out on an SEC field in a hostile environment where you can't hear the snap count and really, you know, kind of learn the hard way. Uh, and I, I think it, it took some time before you start to kind of feel you know, the speed of the game slow down. You can kind of see things in a in a kind of kind of elevated way, and, and you know, honestly, feel like you you belong. And that's when it, I think, really gets fun. I, to to think when that actually happened, I don't know, but I can remember that first year feeling like, all right, I got a lot of I got a lot of room for growth here. Well, you know, from an athletic standpoint, 
your game elevates regardless of your position when you don't have to think you just yeah. have to you do that's and that's right. just that's muscle memory that's visual recognition and it does again it doesn't matter your position but I know that you you practiced your freshman year to the point where you thought maybe you were going to play but you end up getting redshirted and for most of us that's that's a blessing even though sometimes we fight that we we're yeah. good enough to play yeah. but you know we're just the 18 year old knuckleheads wanting to show out yeah coaches hopefully know a little bit better but off the field from a social standpoint from an academic standpoint when did you find your footing in those areas or did it did it ever all come together like within a certain close period of time or did you just find it I'm not trying to get too philosophical yeah. here but it just it's a weird thing to go from high school and to fit in in the yeah. in belt system it, it's a good question. I, I'm not going to broadcast my GPA my first semester, but it was less than desirable, I would say. Uh, yeah, I mean, it. you know, you come into, a, you know, SEC football at Vanderbilt. I mean, that's a full-time, you know, full-time job to some extent at the highest level and mandatory study hours before class and mandatory study hours after practice, which is after class. I mean, it was full days. So it certainly took a, you know, a good year or so to really kind of get your get your bearings in terms of how do you manage the, you know, the, the rigors of the, of the SEC and the, the academics of Vanderbilt. I, I again, to, to remember kind of that crossroads moment would, would be hard, but I think you just kind of start to feel comfortable in your, comfortable in your shoes and comfortable, you know, with where you are. And some of that just comes with experience. Um, and I, I know you had OJ as a, a, a older mentor and player to, you wanted, as we all do, that competitive fire. I'm better than the guy ahead of me. I'm going to try and show out. But I couldn't think of a better mentor than someone like OJ. But in addition to OJ, because I don't want him to get the big head, who else on the offense or maybe on the team that you look to as leaders, as maybe you wanted to, to be like them or at least pattern yourself or your game or, or your personality a little bit within the team environment? Yeah, we had a great tight end group. Yeah, a great tight end group. I mean, you can, you may remember Ken Wisenhunt was our tight ends coach. Ken oh, Wisenhunt yeah. has a great NFL career. So just being able to look up to, I think there's always, it always resonates when you've got a coach that's played at the highest level at the position you play at. So yeah. really looked up to Ken. I mean, our tight end group, you, you know, you go back, Jason Tomacek was a guy that, you yeah. know, had a great career at Vanderbilt. Um, you know, Freddie Baker, certainly OJ, Marcus Williams. Paul was the, the squatty body, kind of the change of pace thumper in the in the tight end room, but all those guys, I think, really, you know, I I can look to and and, and think about learning different aspects of the game from and and uh, and, and looked up to. I mean, you know, early on at, in my career at Vanderbilt, I, I can remember feeling kind of a deep sense of obligation to really try to help lift the offense. We had some great defenses. I mean, you can remember, you know, those those years of you know linebacker you to some extent, and so we were. We were trying to do our part, and you know, I would say, in, in many cases, probably didn't hold our weight. But I can remember a lot of those, you know, defensive players. I mean, Corey Chavis is a guy that I always thought very highly of. Um, you know, Eric Vance, a lot of the linebacker group. I mean, Duncan, Anthony Jordan, Carlton Hall. There's a lot of guys. That, Elliot, I was going to say you're practicing against Sunday players. Yeah. For almost your whole time at Vanderbilt, yeah. and on the offense, particularly in in your position, you're a pinball. You're you're getting. You're getting a real, a real, <laughs> OJ, too late. Ha ha, that's a dollar. <laughs> He's so funny. But you're getting a real education in addition to bumps and bruises and, and yeah. getting knocked on your butt every so often from those guys. But I, I can see that because they had, you're right, Vanderbilt in those in those 90s had some awesome oh. linebackers and defensive players. They sure did. Well, it, you, you got the bumps and bruises, but you also went into a game confident that you're not going to really play anybody much better than who you see. In That's practice. right. That's yeah. exactly right. Now, were you recruited by Dorhauer or his or the staff before Dorhauer? Yeah. So Dorhauer with he, his staff <laughs> was actually, I can't, you know, again, it's funny how stories pop in your head. So Woody at the time was the defensive coordinator. Woody wouldn't right. offer. Dorhauer was the head coach, and I have a memory of. Woody come into Lebanon High School, the old Lebanon High School, um, to meet with Ryan and I. And, you know, of course, Woody's got, you know, the Super Bowl rings from the Steelers. And he, of course, 
you know, letting us see the, the Excuse ring. Excuse me, I, fellas. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, I can remember dropping one and having this moment of like, if there's, you know, diamonds laying on the floor, I just got my, my scholarship revoked. Right, I, right, right. I think I dropped the ring, but uh, yeah. But with then the transition after Dow Howard took to Woody the next year, for you, was there a big change in what your responsibilities or philosophy on offense? Did it change that much with Woody taking over the helm? Yeah, I think for me personally, I was more of an inline guy under, you know, Dow Howard and, and that offense. When Woody took over, a guy named Steve Crosby was the offensive coordinator. And Steve, you know, had, a, I think, an offense that was very tight end friendly. Again, a lot of, lot of, you know, certainly a lot of inline, but lined up, lined up as an H, did a lot of motion. I think he, he found some, you know, creative ways to get the tight end open. So I was fortunate, I think, just being more of a receiving type tight end to right. uh, offense like that. So it was a, a transition, but it was one that I embraced and felt like was good for, for my uh, skill set. All right. It's easy for me to ask you some of your favorite memories about practice or the locker room, and we'll get to that. I want to know what was it about playing college football that really kind of drove you to the edge of, hey, why am I doing this? I feel like I'm hitting my head against the wall every time. And, and I know that may be kind of a personal question, but it's easy for us to talk about all the good memories and all the stuff. But that's not what the college football experience is about. It's not the Instagram world. Some yeah. of it sucks. Some yeah. of it is not fun. Yeah. So to the extent that you want to share anything, and I'm not asking you to tell us about a fight or anything, but whatever that may come to mind that's like, this was a lesson that I had to learn from whether I liked it or not. And I got past it. That yeah. kind of that's what I'm asking about. Yeah. I think any football player that tells you they like two days is lying to you. You know, you, you think about the, the dog. <laughs> they, they got a screw loose. Yeah. Or they got a screw loose. Yeah. You know, maybe a few, but maybe it, especially Nashville, hot, humid summers. I mean, that was, and it, you know, it's by default, it's intended to, you know, bring you to your breaking point and get you through a bit of camaraderie. So you look back and you know what it was, but, that was miserable. I, I can remember, I think my true freshman year missing class and having to run the stadium steps before practice. Mm -hmm. So you run, you, you can kind of see the image behind you. You go up and down every, every aisle. The, the problem with Vandy Stadium in, in, in a unique way is it's, it's big, but it's not big enough where it's got multi-layers, multi-tiers. Yeah. So you got to go all the way to the top and all the way down. So I can remember having to run that whole thing and then practice afterward thinking, gosh, what, what in the world am I doing? But, you know, those are the moments that kind of build the character and, you know, get you past the, the hard stuff that you're going to deal with. Could you imagine running the stadium at Michigan or at A&M or even at Neyland Stadium as, as high as those stadiums are? No, it, it, yeah, it, I can, I can remember thinking how dangerous it was, you know, you, you start to feel the legs shake out and you start thinking if I, if I make one wrong step, this is going to be a, a long way down, you know. Now, did you ever have the pleasure of the times or time that you ran the stadium where you were carrying any amount of weight in your hands or your arms? I don't remember carrying weight in the stadium. We would do, and I don't remember the name of it now, but in the off season, we would do training in Memorial Gym. And I can remember having to do fireman's carry where you'd throw one of your teammates on your on your shoulders and run up the bleachers in Memorial. So I can remember one of my good buddies, Steve Tracy. Steve is lighter now, but I'm going to say weighed close to three bills back then. And that was a shaky leg uh, situation for sure. But I don't remember running with any weighted vests or anything in the, in the stadium. I remember one of our summer workouts where we were in the stadium and we were running. It was the equivalent. It's not a 440 because around that field is not 440. No. It's around the field mm -hmm. and having to hold. 25 pound weights above your your head and it was a relay uh -huh. and you know you do that two or three times even the strongest of guys that sucks yeah that, that is just not fun yeah um, <laughs> well elliot let's let's get off the field for a few minutes yeah where did you and, and tyler and the boys where did y'all like to hang out in town i always ask this because the establishments always change over the decades yeah like it, I think way before you got there, we had Banditos, which was a bar directly across the street from Towers. And in the parking lot, it's now a parking lot, was a sand pit volleyball right adjacent to West End Avenue. So you okay. can imagine what would happen over there. Yeah. 
but it was a very let's put it this way a very athletes friendly venue yeah but where where did you guys hang out where would y'all go yeah it's funny when you talk to people from nashville now and i've got friends that will go to visit and they ask me where to go and i typically say i don't know because i'll tell you a place that's probably closed but you know back in the late 90s it was broadway second avenue and then you had a little bit of the campus there weren't you know the a lot of the boroughs now the gulch sobro that was just kind of industrial not, not the circus that it's become yeah but i can remember you know certainly on campus or the near campus area i mean satco which is still there was a great spot um and then you get over on the you know into the downtown area buffalo billiards was a great place uh a place called have a nice day cafe on second avenue um banana i remember banana joe's and i think it was banana joe's seems like they had like you know at least i heard nickel long neck beers on tuesday night i mean some you know <laughs> Some crazy right. deal. Um, and then the, you know, the Lonnie's right off Printer's Alley. I mean, that that's always been a, a popular spot. So those are some that, that come to mind. Nice. Now we had the cooker right on campus. Was was the cooker still the cooker your the cooker, year? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh man, many, many meals were had there. That's for the sure. cooker and, and for us, we were fortunate. Ryan, all his parents would come out a lot and, and uh, you know, take us to to lunch after the games and Houston's was a good spot for that. Yeah, that was yeah. always a great, great meal. And if it was late at night, you needed some grease, Rotiers. Yeah. Rest in peace, Rotiers. Is, that was the place for decades across the I street. heard it. Is it gone? I heard it. It is completely torn down. Wow. Yep. That's unbelievable. Yeah. There's a lot of those old establishments are coming down for the sake of progress. We took our, uh, we had friends in town, took them to Elliston Place Soda Shop, that, which now is a newer building, but I was glad yeah. that was still there. That's still great. Yeah. Great. No, that's, that's a fun place. But guys, if you're just tuning in and you don't recognize Big E, I got Elliot Carson, class of 01 with me tonight. He's in Denver. And I failed to ask you, tell us what you do in Denver. Tell us a little bit about your beautiful family and your, your profession these days. Yeah, I actually been with a company called Patterson Dental now for 17 years. Mm -hmm. Moved to four different states. Actually met my wife through dental. My wife's a dental hygienist. So I, uh, we're, we're a dental distributor. We sell and support everything you see in the dental office. So it's been a little time in Atlanta where I met my wife, Hannah. Um, she grew up in Arkansas, went to hygiene school out there. And spent a little time, again, I mentioned with, with Roth out in Farragut. I, I led our team out in Knoxville for about a year and a half, which was a an interesting experience. Entire team, of course, were ball fans. So I had to, you know, right. walk the tight line and, and then <laughs> moved to Minnesota. Our corporate office is in Minnesota. So it's been about four years there. And then moved out here end of end of 2016. So we've moved around a little bit with the company, you know, all, all by choice, which has been great. But really love it in Denver. I, I think that, you know, a lot of times people ask me what I think about it out here growing up in the South. I tell you, not having humidity is a beautiful thing. It just you know, that that nice dry, dry air. You can I mean I can remember. You probably can't do that Hawaii game. You sit out in the, the sun and you know, that humidity just, just cooks you. So the, the low humidity has been good out here. We enjoy it. So. Yeah, but you know, one thing I really just can't wrap my head around. Did you try the Spam Rice Seaweed Wrap? I, I mean, did, no, actually. Uh, what the hell is that? And why am I supposed to enjoy that? It was gross. I, you know, I agree. You ought to have, I know you know Andrew Carr. Andrew's a, a good buddy of mine. Andrew's little yeah. brother Addison came out of the game and actually brought some with him. They, they live in California. He actually had homemade, I don't remember that it's got a name, but he actually brought some out and we had one on the plane. So it is a, that's certainly a win in Rome type experience. Well, my daughter and I tried it three different ways, the way that they suggested, just try it plain and hot. Then we put some kind of a local sauce on. It was like a like a spicy ginger and that made it even worse and then they told us to put like a mustard based and i just i'm sorry i tried i just it's just look i live in birmingham alabama give me barbecue every day but yeah anyway i, I get it yeah. but <laughs> elliot let's talk about your level of skiing and the girls who's the best skier in the family right now that, let's see. We're all on a, from a scale of one to ten. We're all at a zero. Uh, we we it, you know we there's a there's a funny story maybe for another day. I uh, so yeah. shouldn't say funny. We um, we have it. I think skiing is one of those things you got to kind of grow. It's got to be in your DNA. If you grow up skiing, you got ski legs. Um, it's a blast. I mean, for us, I didn't ski probably until I was in my thirties. Mm -hmm. um and when you really don't know it that well not always 90 percent of skiing you know, 
did I buckle this? Did I strap that? Right, I right. It's, it's very foreign. And, and we've been trying to get the girls out. I mean, to live here, we've got two daughters now that are 13 and nine, and, you know, kind of feel like to live here and not ski is a waste, but had a little bit of a, uh, you know, I would say traumatic experience on the ski lift with the girls last year. And now we've been struggling to, to get them back out. Um, so skiing for us, I, we're more of a, a summer mountains family. We like to go up in the, you know, get a place in the summer and just enjoy the crisp weather. I'm, I've gotten to where I love the mountain bike. So we, we end up doing that more than skiing, but we got to get them back out. We did kind of the, try to give them a life lesson about, you know, once you fall off the horse, get back on. So our last ski adventure was, did not, uh, did not go well. Well, I, I hope the future one does, yeah. but I echo your sentiment about summertime uh, out West. Yeah. There's the, anyway, we could, we could hold our a whole conversation just on those experiences in the summer, but we're going to get back to some Vanderbilt football. During the years that you were there and playing tight end, you went up against some many Sunday players on the opposing teams. Yeah. Do you remember who gave you the most fits? Do you remember who maybe you had a good game against and it su maybe surprised you a little bit or you just had his number that day? Yeah. You know, I think for me, just the, maybe the, the way that I played body type, I, would, I always felt more comfortable with the, the athletic quick guys. I mean, guys that come to mind that I think I can remember playing well against Javon Curse, um, John Abraham of South Carolina. Th those guys were, you know, freaks in terms of athleticism. Yeah. Um, but I felt like I always matched up well. The guys that always gave me fits were the the Sean Ellis's. I can remember Sean Ellis at UT. You know, Marcus Stroud was, a, I think, a 300-pound defensive end at Georgia. Those big strong kind of bull rush guys that they yeah. there was a guy I was thinking about it before our, our call uh, at Ole Miss you, you know when you when you watch the draft they always show a couple highlights of every player the thing you don't want to be is the guy on the other guy's highlight and I can remember the guy my senior year guy from Ole Miss I think he went the third fourth round I can't recall his name but it was one of his two clips was him just completely destroying me on a pass rush. So I, I, I mom, I made the draft. That's right. Yeah. I'm here, but not for the right reason. I mean, <laughs> those, the, the really big stout bull rush guys were, were challenging, but like I said, some of those were, you know, the Leonard little, I, I can remember playing against again, you know, Javon curse is just one of the most freakish athletes I've ever been around, but I, I can remember matching up relatively well with those guys. And all these guys are Sunday guys you're, you're naming and yeah. it just it never ends. It never ends. All right, what was your best catch? What was your best run or play that really, I don't know, it could have been an acrobatic catch or you made a, you may have had, made a block that sprung, uh, I don't know who was the mate, was it Zach or who was the main running back back then? Well, we had Jimmy, of course, played running back some, uh, Jared McGrath, Rodney Williams, some of those guys were Lou Thomas, yeah. Did you have any pancakes or just any any big memories where you were able to, to make a big play or help in a big play that really come to mind? Yeah, you know, I, I can remember, it's funny, I, I can remember in uh, in film sessions, Todd Yoder and I having, uh, you know, kind of just fun side bets about, you know, we, we were guys that liked to get outside and could, could you know, chop block pretty well or cut pretty well, um, mm -hmm. some of those outside blocks. So I can remember, you know, having some good blocks that would, you know, would, would break one of our running backs loose. Um, I bet that's got to be a good feeling when you're either on the ground or on top of the guy you're blocking and you look up at the, the corner of your eye and all you see is, is asses and elbows carrying the ball down the field. It's a, yeah. Especially when you know, you, when you know, you made a block that sprung somebody. Now the alternative is when you know, you missed a block that would have done it and you have to, you're getting ready for the film study that's going to come. Um, that's immediately what coming. you're walking back to the huddle and you know, 24 hours from now, I'm going to have to eat some dirt. And but, you, you hope you're in one of those blind spots where it didn't get caught in the wide angle, it didn't get caught. Right, in the right, yeah. right. Well, just wait, wait till they do the drone video oh. of games. You'll never be able to hide. But what about, and, and thank goodness with my position, I never had this, but what about that time when you're blocking and your running back ends up right in your back and just yeah. plows you or you, you know, y'all all go down. Yeah. I know you've had that before. Yeah, I had to actually, I, I remember, I think a high ankle sprain before that was even a term, but I, I can remember in spring practice, and I don't recall the running back, I wouldn't out him anyway, but, you know, you engage with a, you know, a, a defensive lineman and have somebody kind of hit you right in the back, and I remember that being, that was one of the more difficult ankle injuries I ever had to get over, fortunately it was mm -hmm. in the spring, but 
you know, you, it's, it's hard when you're kind of locked up with somebody and then someone else kind of hits you low, you're kind of in a, in a defenseless position. Um, you know, one, I, one funny story I just thought about, and I don't recall the name, there was a defensive lineman for Alabama. I just remember this because everybody gave me a hard time. We had a, I don't remember the name of the motion, but you start out in a slot motion inside and crack down. And I, I don't know if this is accurate, but I remember everybody giving me a hard time saying that the guy uh, was actually blind in the eye that we cracked down on. So we, you know, he didn't have any vision. So I can remember laying out a pretty big guy, but it could have been just completely by chance that he didn't see me. But I remember getting a hard time for, I, I didn't call the play naturally, so it wasn't my fault. But I, hey, the alternative is he turns his head right in time and then flattens you. That's right. He sees you and outweighs you by 50 or 100 pounds. And then I can remember that that situation happening with others. I, Richard Seymour, I can remember getting me pretty good on a Hall of Famer now, but I can remember a, we called it bang motion. So you kind of start inside just before the snap. Right. You right. know, trap an inside tackle that was probably a good 60 pounds heavier than you. So yeah, yeah unfortunately, the, the name just... <laughs> That's a bad description for what happened. Yeah. yeah. All right. Take us into the towers. Those Saturday night post basketball parties. You don't have yeah. to name names, but how fun were those? It was a blast. I mean, that was, you know, one of the things we were talking about before was just the, the memories. I mean, the, the, you know, it's no secret. We didn't win as many games as, as we would have liked. We, we, but I, I, I remember the the camaraderie. I remember, really, I remember going into every game, you know, I've got friends that ask me now, why did you really think you were going to be, you know, Peyton Manning and the balls or whoever, I, you never go into a game thinking you're going to lose. Um, but you, you go into that competition, blood, sweat, tears, and just having, you know, a Saturday night with your buddies. I can remember those t parties at Towers. Little known fact, my uh, DJ skills were widely known. Um, oh, no, it's not a little known fact. We oh, all that know, and that, that's where I was headed with this. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I was known to play classics like, you know, Ghetto Cowboy by Bone Thugs and Harmony, um, you know, Bow down by uh, I don't remember the ice cream. I mean, I, all the classics, right? I, I could play those. Well, on the, on the well thing. what I don't know is what was your DJ name for those parties? Was it just Big E? <laughs> yeah, I mean, people probably had a name for me that I wasn't yeah. aware of. Uh, I probably annoyed them because I played the same four songs over and over, but I enjoyed it, you know. So, it, it uh, yeah. My years when we would have those, usually they were post basketball parties on Saturday nights. We had a couple of guys. And they've been on the show and they've talked about this, Denardi and Smitty and, and those guys of my years. Elliot, they would clear out one of the doubles in the corner, take all the furniture out. They had built in a bar. And then one of the other players, usually Jeff Mays or somebody else, was the DJ. Yeah. So that was a legit hangout bar and DJ booth yeah. for the entire floor. And on a on a given night. A rough estimate of 200 to 250 people crammed all around the elevator and bathroom <laughs> and that whatever that study room was yeah. crazy just yeah crazy. Well, yeah i was gonna say whatever the whatever the capacity was we definitely push it to the limit because if i remember right with towers you had four kind of four in the corners right yeah and yeah. inevitably there would be a few few rooms of, of teammates but towers parties i don't know if you ever lived in I think it was called Mayfield. We lived in Mayfield one year. So there were 10, a little bit of a funny story. There were 10 uh, individual rooms. So it was nine of us on the team. And I, I guess just the way it shook out, we ended up getting paired with a non-player. Um, that, <laughs> that poor dude. That uh, poor he, dude. <laughs> yeah. He, I think his name was Tom. I think he actually had a young family. If I remember right, he was married and had a child. And, and he like At he Mayfield? Go, at Mayfield, he would go in and out of the room through his window just not to have to deal with us knuckleheads. It was, a, it was oh, a, I I want him on this show because yeah. I bet that was a rough year for that. Yeah, guy. he probably. I, well, he, if I remember right, like, <laughs> he didn't spend a lot of time there for obvious reasons. But yeah, it was <laughs> nine of us, and and uh, I think it was Tom. Yeah, the nine choir boys and Tom. And that's right. Family. That's right. <laughs> well, Elliot, we've got a few more minutes, and I I really appreciate you taking us down your your path, but I want to talk about your post Vanderbilt football experiences. You had brushes in a couple of different leagues and went overseas. So when you finished up your eligibility, at what stage, either that fall or that spring, did it percolate? Did it start to come to fruition that, hey, there may be something here for me. So kind of take us through that experience, if you will. 
Yeah, you know, I think going <clears throat> going into my senior year, um, I think I, I earned all SEC honors my junior year. And I, I can remember some conversations just about maybe there's the potential um, for that. Um, so I think going into my senior year and then coming out of my senior year, I was fortunate to get invited to the combine play in at that time the the uh, the blue gray game, which they held on Christmas Day down in in uh, in Montgomery. Montgomery. Montgomery, that's right. Yeah. In, I went to many of those back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think just kind of coming out of that, I, I knew I had an opportunity, certainly wasn't going to be a, a high draft pick, but, but felt like there was some potential and ended up not getting drafted. Signed with the Cardinals and really in, in Arizona, felt like I was in a, a pretty good spot there. Um, unfortunately, got injured, which, you know, as an undrafted free agent, you get injured. That's that's kind of the, the, the end of that the deal. It usually ends it, doesn't it? Yeah. So I it was fortunate there. I had, you know, Corey Chavis was, was playing with the Cardinals then, so it was nice to have a you know, former teammate kind of mentor. Um, so got injured, came back. I remember doing workouts for several teams. I could, I, the, the Saints, I think, the Packers, the Colts, you know, you go in, guys get injured during the season, they bring three or four guys in, nothing ever really struck. And I think I'd done a workout with the Colts and was flying back from that. And my agent called and said that the Titans wanted to sign me and wanted to allocate me over to NFL Europe. So I think I signed with the Titans that January of the following year, 20 or 2002. And then at the time, NFL Europe was kind of a developmental league, so they allocate players. So you're on a technically on an NFL roster. You go play in the summer and then come back in camp and try to make the team. So I went over and played in Scotland for a year, which was a great experience. And then I had a couple, couple of game, a couple of preseason games with the Titans back when they had Frank Wycheck, um, Kenny Mayer, and Kenny played at Florida and then uh, got cut after the second game. And then you, you know you reach that point where, like, all right, I can keep chasing it, or I, I, I can yeah. you just say, hey, I had the opportunity, time to time to move on so yeah well but that that year that you're that season you spent overseas in, in yeah. scotland did you have any time to travel or to take in the local culture or were you guys pretty much set on just just playing and practicing and that kind of thing you had time i, I look back i didn't take advantage of it i was a 20 well, I, I mean i didn't really even take any pictures of course that was again before cell phones but now right. you right. can remember oh, i don't need to take pictures i'll remember it but Typically, you would so that if I remember right, there were six teams, and you play every team at home and away. So I think it was for Scotland. There was a team in Amsterdam, three in Germany, Barcelona. So you'd fly in on a Friday, play Saturday, and typically stay Saturday night. So you'd be able to go out in country on a Saturday night um, before traveling back, and then on an off weekend, you know, we lived in Scotland if you wanted to take a train to to Ireland. So we, we definitely got to see some things looking back now, as much as I like to travel, I would have done more, but, but definitely have some good memories. But you know, that's, that's just once again, not that we've really touched on it much here, but it, you know, Vanderbilt and playing football that opened an opportunity, a new experience yeah. for you that you probably, if you just been a regular student or not gone to Vanderbilt, you might not have had that opportunity. So that was pretty cool that you got to do that at such a young age and play ball. That's yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It was a blast. I mean, again, I take a lot of good memories from that guys that I, I, you know, that's, that's one of those things, everybody kind of probably similar to minor league baseball guys are just grinding, you know, you're not yeah. doing it at that point for the money you're doing it for the dream and to, to be able to, to make it in the, in the, in the big league. So it was a, it was a fun time. Yeah. I still think every spring that I've got a couple more innings left in me. Yeah. I just, I hadn't gotten the call yet, but I'm available. But uh, your cell, it's probably cell phone coverage is probably dropping out. That, yeah. That's exactly right. Ellie, let's, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but I got a couple more topics I want to talk about. The years that you were at Vanderbilt, you had two different head coaches, which a lot of us do because there's, frankly, there's only been a handful of coaches to stay five years or more in the last 50 years. Right. Hopefully coach Lee is, we'll get to him in just a minute on the right trajectory, but the culture inside the team is different than the what I'll call the 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 average fan, the street. Uh, what do they call it? the sidewalk alums? I don't know how many of those we have. We have actual alums, but we're so small compared to state schools. But here's my question: When you're a team, you're a team, and those are your brothers. And I know you've got those buddies, Tyler, etc. That even if you don't see each other all the time, a quick text or a phone call, or even seeing each other takes you right back to certain memories but here here's where I'm going with this when you're in that locker room every team if they're a decent team on scoreboard or not they have leaders on the team they also have the jokesters everybody has a role if you will yeah. 
Yeah. And we've mentioned several of those leaders already, Jamie Duncan, et cetera. But what I want to ask you is take us inside the locker room. And for those who weren't your years, it's different for everybody. Yeah. What kind of describe that locker room environment, if you will, that that's where I want to go with this. Yeah. You know, you, you, it, regardless of the program, you're typically a college team is, is comprised of a lot of high school kids that had success, right? I mean, most, most kids that are playing, you know, division one college football, a lot came from a winning program and contributed to that. So you, you're not coming in with a, you know, winning is a very tricky concept. I mean, it, it's kind of that, and I think that's where Vanderbilt is now. You, you kind of have to win to have a winning tradition, but you can't have a winning tradition without winning kind of that chicken or the egg. Right, right. But it, you know, you come in with a lot of guys from high school that are used to winning. Maybe they won state championships. And so there's always a belief of being able to turn the corner. And I think what's, what looking back, what's cool about Vanderbilt is you always wanted to be, you know, that, that team that turned it around. I mean, I can remember, you know, us being, we had an opportunity my junior year to make a bowl game. And I think that would have been the first bowl team since 82. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you want to be that, you know, that team that that's able to kind of turn the corner and, and change the culture. And it, it's, it really just is that internal belief system. And I think it, it you know, it, it, it's those moments where um, somebody returns a kickoff, a random fumble, where winning teams believe, hey, that's a blip, we'll get past it. And, and sometimes I think teams that lose a lot are like, uh oh, it's happening, right? The, the, you know, we're starting to unravel. So it's just that belief system that starts to build. But like I mentioned earlier, I can never absolutely, re you know, recall going into a game thinking, well, this is, you know, Georgia or Florida or Alabama. Let's just try to keep it close. You go in believing truly that you can, that you can win. And, um, you know, I, I think you, you hear the phrase, you, sometimes you, you learn more in a loss than a win. I, I think, you know, as Vanderbilt players, we, we, we've learned a lot, right? I mean, we, we, yeah. we've dealt with it. So. Well, I, and I, I wanted, that leads me to, to where we are now. And for any of you who follow this program or follow what I put in our Facebook group, you know that I'm a firm believer in back what Coach Lee is, is doing. Yeah. And I really believe he is changing the culture of inside the program in that locker room. And he's getting the players to buy into his, I'll call it the process. I'm not sure the term that he uses. But two weeks ago, who would have thought that we would have pulled off two straight wins against decent SEC schools with a chance for this Saturday to go bowling. Yeah. And who knows how it's going to turn out against the Orange. I can see us winning this game. I truly can because we're peaking. Mm -hmm. But the amount of time that you've spent maybe in Hawaii or I don't know if you've been to Nashville since, but what are you seeing Elliot, what are what are kind of some of your thoughts about what you're seeing? Because we've gone from zero wins in 20, two wins last year, and now five wins on the brink of of potentially bowling. Yeah, it, I mean, I first and foremost, I thank the world of Clark. I, his his older sister was a good my, friend of mine in college. Know the Lee family. I mean, just thank the world of the family, and it's it's great not only to have a great you know a great coach in terms of caliber and pedigree, but someone who lives and, you know, believes in Vanderbilt. So just really excited about Clark. It, yeah. It, it culture, culture is an amazing thing. I mean, I, you know, you probably can speak to it. I've experienced it both in sports and in, in the professional world. You know, you, you, I can recall the saying culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture is just one of those things that can, can supersede a lot of things. And it, it just, it takes a, a belief system in the process and a, and a belief system that if you keep doing the right things day after day, the results will come. And I think the last two weeks, to your point, are, are proof of that. They you know, two quality wins, a, a ranked Kentucky team, a Florida team that's certainly talented. And so and then, you, you know, that 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 flywheel starts to spin once the team realizes, OK, we can we can win, we can compete. You start to build on that and you start to build on that. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I love what I'm seeing. And I think the last two weeks kind of speak to how that, that culture can really start to, to and you know, fair away. You know, you could really not to super analyze the season. We were 40 yards away from beating Missouri before then. Yeah. Now we had a hiccup against South Carolina, but I was at that game. And frankly, I thought that was a winnable game. 
Yeah. But my point being here is in the last several years, we have not been as competitive, nearly as competitive on the brink of winning several of these games as we have been. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll stop about that. And I've got a, a couple of more things to ask you or to get your input or your, some of your recollection, Elliot. Living out in Denver, I can't imagine there's too terribly many Vanderbilt fans or alums. I'm sure there are some. Yeah. But I suspect you run into other SEC fans uh, along the way or maybe that come through your practice. <laughs> How do you deal with those guys or gals who give you a hard time about Vanderbilt? Yeah, it, every once in a while you'll see a you know a black and gold star. There's a few out here, and it's always a good you know good chance to connect. Um, I, I, it's funny I've started to see more orange pop up recently. UT fans when they start winning, they there they come. I was going to say they won a couple of games, so they come out. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So I've I've seen some of that, but uh, yeah, you know the the uh, the banter is always good. It's always good when you when you run into somebody in the SEC. It's been great. I mean, I can remember early on as I kind of moved out of Nashville. Finding a bandy game on TV was really difficult, but at this point, with streaming services, with all the sports channels, there aren't many games that <laughs> get on TV. Um, they were out here a couple of years ago, opened up at CSU, which was a was a great time. I've got a few folks on my team that were CSU grads, so we were able to to brag a little bit there. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's 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 always great to see how the SEC spreads. Us that are in it, we certainly know what the SEC is, and and you know we're passionate about it. But there's 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 SEC folks everywhere for sure. There are, and, and the more that we keep being competitive and winning these games, they're going to keep coming out and keep coming out. And, yeah. and I, I can't thank you enough, Bud, for one, making friends with you out in Hawaii and hanging out a little bit at the game and then coming on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. No, absolutely. I've, I've seen your work. I really appreciate it. Like I said, everything you're doing and it's been great to, to spend some time with you. Well, thank you. And don't, don't go off when we sign off. I got two things I want to share with you. Okay. I want to remind you guys who are watching, go back into the discussion feed. And I'm sorry if I blow it up. There's a lot to share. Just announced either today or yesterday is the new Anchor Collective that Jason Burns and a couple others are spearheading. I can't tell you the specifics. Go into the website and, and check that out. There's an article with Barton Simmons in there. There's a um, website that tells you all about it but Jason and Michael one of his partners are going to come on the show in December and we're going to talk all about it and then the other thing for those of you who are on WhatsApp hopefully you know what that is but we've got about maybe close to 50 former players now connected through WhatsApp and we talk about during the game and that that was actually a lot of fun the other night watching some of the game and getting instant feedback. We talk about other things too, but if you're interested in continuing, not a daily conversation, but as often as you want to participate, find us again, the link is in the, uh, in the discussion thread, but I want to wish all of you guys a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you all for, for just continuing to build our community. If you've got other friends who were part of the program, whether they played football cheer trainer manager or coach who you're connected with on facebook invite them into our group because we want to continue to build that that community elliot again thank you bud uh, i'm going to hang or sign off from now and hang on elliot for just a minute you guys yeah. have happy thanksgiving everybody <laughs>